Good morning or good afternoon or good evening. Thank you for joining us today from around the world for this online book presentation and panel discussion, which is also being recorded and available to watch immediately afterwards. This event is organized and hosted by the IAE's Ukraine office, which administers Fulbright program in Ukraine. A warm welcome from Kyiv here on behalf of the IAE Ukraine office. My name is Veronika Aleksanich, and I am a program officer for the Fulbright Scholar Programs. Today, I am extremely happy to be joined by the author of the book, Dr. Jessica Zichovich, and I would like to extend my warm welcome to our panelists, Ms. Oksana Bruchovetska, Dr. Michael Fowler, and Dr. Tamara Martinuk, as well as our moderator, Peter stratton Bajer. The, um, in the next 90 minutes, Dr. Jessica Zehovich will present first her new book, Superfluous Woman, Feminism, Art and Revolution in 21st Century Ukraine, which came out with the University of Toronto Press. I'm sorry, I'm just... Oh, well, then our three panelists will present some of their observations and comments on the theme covered in the book and ask questions to, Dr. Jess to which Dr. Jessica will, Zichowicz will respond. After that, we will open up the floor to questions from the audience. I would like to remind you that you are invited to ask your questions or type in your comments using the chat window on the Facebook streaming page. Your voices and thoughts are very valuable to us. Please be sure to include your full name if it is not already your username on Facebook. We'll only be able to include a few select questions from the audience due to time limitations. As we rely on technology for this event, please be aware that technical glitches, interruptions of uh, sound or video are possible. So please bear with us. Для наших українських глядачів ми хотіли б нагадати, що презентація книги доктора Зихович «Зайві жінки. Фемінізм, мистецтво і революція в Україні у 21 столітті. Обговорення, пору... Обговорення порушених у ній тем проводитимуться англійською мовою. Проте ви можете ставити запитання і залишати коментарі англійською і українською у віконечку для чату на сторінці Facebook. So, let's get started. And it's my pleasure to take the mic over to our enthusiastic moderator, Peter stratton -Bager. Peter is a brilliant, is a filmmaker based in San Francisco, California, USA. He was a Fulbright Scholar in Area Studies in 2017 to 2018 to the Lee Polytechnic National University. So, Peter, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, my role here will be um, sort of this timekeeper. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, please excuse me if there's going to be any abrupt transitions that we need to move along because we want to give everyone a chance to ask questions. So um, again, any apologies if we have some abrupt transitions here. Um, I would just like to briefly um, introduce uh, the panel, starting with our uh, guest of honor that I was delighted to get to know during my Fulbright year. Um, in Ukraine, 2017-2018, and um, you know that is um, Dr. Jessica Zikowitz, and uh, the author of Superflu Superfluous Women, Femin Feminism, Art, and Revolution in 21st Century Ukraine, who is also a U.S. Fulbright Scholar, 2017-2018, uh, and um, she was at the Kiev Mohila Academy, and um, she is currently at the um, Contemporary Ukraine Studies Program at the University of Alberta, and um, well, uh, her back academic background is you know, a doctorate from uh, University of Michigan. Um, other um, uh, panels I'd like to introduce um, is, um, we'll go in um, alphabetical order, <laughs> is um, Oksana Bruchovetska, artist, curator, and publicist um, in Kiev. And then there is, um, Mayhill, Dr. Mayhill Flower, who is Associate Professor of History at Stetson University in Florida. And she's the director of Stetson's, Stetson's program in uh, Russia, um, East Europe and Eurasian Studies. And she was also a Fulbright Scholar in Ukraine. And then there is Dr. Um, Tamara Martinuk, Associate Professor of Sociology at Kiev Mohila, uh, gender expert, US Helsinki Human Rights uh, Union. And she was a Fulbright Scholar in the US uh, at the Harriman Institute at Columbia University. 
So um, over, over to Jessica, she could start. And um, here we go. <laughs> Great, thank you so much for that introduction. And first I want to say thank you to the Fulbright program for hosting me um, in 2017, 2018. It was an instrumental year for finishing this book. And I also um, highly advocate for listeners to apply to Fulbright. It is such an important program um, for the last century in the United States, bringing scholars to the US and um, also allowing Americans to go abroad. So without um, further ado, also I will, sound a note of, of gratitude to my current Canadian hosts. I am right now in Edmonton. You can see behind me a mountain that evokes the Rockies, but it's actually Mount Whitney from my home state of California. Um, writing this book was a lot like crossing the Rockies. I did not know where I was going much of the time. I was writing something from scratch that I tried to make rather comprehensive, but there was no authoritative text behind what I was doing because the years between the Orange Revolution in 2004 and the Maidan Revolution of Dignity in 2014 um, have been handled very selectively and um, not really systematically discussed because so much attention both in media and um, now in, in more recent scholarship has converged upon 2014 and beyond. So I hope this book is really an open door for future researchers to engage with it and, and unfold out of it new histories. This is by no means a perfect text. No history should be authoritative, really. No history should be considered final and complete. And that's how I will approach this presentation, knowing that the discussions here are living history, that there are many names that appear in my acknowledgements and the body of the text and the index, which is the sign of a contemporary, really a contemporary writing of, of event, but also actors that put pressure on events as they are changing. So. Let me just share my screen here because I want to show a few images uh, that I've selected from the text from each chapter and just kind of give an overview of the narrative arc of this text. Let's see if I can switch over here. Let's see. So here's the cover of my book. And it is available at University of Toronto Press. There's also an ebook version available. And I have a website, which I've listed here. If you Google my name, it should pop up. So anyone who is interested in reviewing this book, please contact me. Um, I can arrange for a review copy to be sent to you. And if you have any other questions or you want to engage further, definitely you know, reach out and contact me. So this particular image that I'm starting with is kind of, it's at the, it's in the conclusion of my book, actually. It says, stop propaganda, there is no fascism here. Patriotism is the idea of the Maidan. This was written in upturned cobblestones in 2014 <clears throat> on May 1st, where I, I had encountered um, the, my, the end of events on the Maidan while things were happening in 2014. Um, I was, you know, doing a lot of translation and working mostly online to coordinate um, demonstrators and help with events. But then towards the end of events, I went to the site of the Maidan and observed things. And um, this was just before Easter that year. So it was also interesting to observe an Easter. But I want to point out that <clears throat> the um, slogan here seems very much arranged for satellite for international news to converge on this site. And this is the entry point upon which I think many um, 
who have been following Ukraine would would know would would know the mass media around Ukraine in the West, and for the purposes of my first two chapters of my book, I'm looking a lot at mass media, and I'm and I'm trying really to to turn and examine the Western gaze upon not only women and gender in different areas of the world and particular looking at not only you know the post arab spring but also um, post occupy moment of this transnational conversation of gender in the media but i'm also thinking about how ukraine really was at the avant-garde and a crossroads for um, what has now evolved into a propaganda information war and this idea of fascism, these, uh, these you know, political terms that become weaponized against um, different cultures is something that I hope my analyses can help prevent. So in the next slide, I will show you um, this particular moment of the 1970s in feminist activism in, in the United States was really concerned with media and with media representations of women. And in this particular um, group, Suzanne Lacey and Leslie Labovitz at that time in 1977 staged a protest um, against the silencing of, of women and domestic violence cases concerning women's rights in particular, this was re in response to a rape case then under consideration in Los Angeles in front of Los Angeles City Hall. And they were using um, the cloaked body, the completely covered body as a way to comment on the silencing or the invisibility of women. And my title of my book is really about the superfluous being a concept that is going back to the 19th century in Russian and Slavic literature, but is also a tongue in cheek irony of how women's needs oftentimes are silenced for convenient um, measures that we might not um, have a, a language to articulate. So a lot of this discussion of media is both about um, taking images that are highly ambivalent and pushing against the written text or the language of the law because laws are are formulated in language and developing a new language that is universal enough to transcend cultures and form solidarities around women's rights so i say that also with a lot of critique of my of my own position and my own context in the United States, knowing you know when I wrote this book, when I started this project, when I sat down to really you know conceive the first pages after spending a research trip in Ukraine in 2011, I was in Birmingham, Alabama, and the local um, liberal arts school was lined with police. Police were called in because a student had called a threat on a female, a death threat in on a female professor who said that she was a feminist. So I know that these terms, feminist, feminism, domestic violence, they, they are highly contested in my own culture, in my own context. So I started thinking more about this group, Femin, because they were circulating a lot in Western media. And this particular image here on the left won the World Press Photo Contest in 2013. The image on the right is from 2011, from the research trip that really spawned this project in which I visited then Femin's headquarters in Kiev, um, which, in wh which they were collecting media about themselves. And I interviewed one of their founding members, Anna Hutzel, about her group. And that was a very um, enlightening interview, but it actually was um, contradictory and not always aligned with some of the other opinions of this group that I encountered throughout interviewing other feminists in Ukraine. 
So it was interesting to me just to, to start to expose myself more to the conversation and again to the language in Ukrainian of feminism and women's rights at this time, because others were writing about feminine in Ukrainian journals. This is a world press photo from 2012. Again, these images are not iconic for my book. I have 68 images, so I chose just a few to kind of curate here for this talk. Um, and this is a sex worker from Kriviri, Ukraine. Uh, this was taken in the context of um, an NGO, HIV AIDS NGO, um, operated by the wife of Viktor Pinchuk. So it was not a spontaneous photograph. It was part of a larger effort, I believe, to intervene. But what is interesting and important here, what I'm trying to show you is the um, constellation of media around women and gender intensifying at this point in time. You see 2013, 2012. This was the image from 2011, world press photo of um, a woman, a mother holding her son in a mosque in Sana'a, Yemen, um, after the anti-government protests against a very corrupt regime at this time. And what I found much later in 2016, following up on, on my analysis in my book about these images, which I'm not going to rehash here for purposes of time, was an icon by former um, late now deceased feminist member Oksana Sashko that resembles in form the exact shapes of the world press image from 2011. However, the dying male activist has been replaced with a Baroque Ukrainian style 16th century angel that you might see in, a, in traditional icon painting. I think this um, is a very powerful juxtaposition of cultures that speaks not only to transformations that have happened over the last um, 20 years, especially with increased immigration in the EU and in Ukraine, but also in the United States in the flurry of images around the Iraq war and post Iraq war and the US's intervention and pulling back out of the Middle East. So I critique in my book a little bit some of these juxtapositions, but this is not the main argument or the driver of what I am looking at. Here, there is a, another image from the same series, also involving um, Christian iconography. This is also by Oksana Sashko. You can see three angels here um, smoking and drinking. So she's kind of playing along or playing uh, with our identifications of purity and sanctity in a sort of gendered virgin versus the fallen woman idea and, and kind of uncovering or turning on its head those expectations and gender binaries of performance. A lot of the discussion in my second chapter is about performative um, identities, which are different. The idea of performative in, in gender analysis is, um, is, is from Judith Butler and really is about uh, emphasizing that gender is not a predefined role, but it is a performed and enacted habitus or inhabitants of one's identity. And this in performance in, in fe by Femin, but also many, many others that I'm trying to um, bring along in my book into uh, spaces in, you know, into an academic context in the West that would know Femin, but not know anything else about Ukraine. I want them to see that there is such a panoply, a wide panoply of performance and art in Ukraine that deals with bringing um, what might be invisible into visibility, showing not necessarily um, categorizing, but showing and performing other ways of being that, that are not, you know, 
already at the center of attention in media or in other avenues. So this particular series is from my third chapter, which is called Image is the Frame, the Feminist Collective Offensiva and the Photographer Evgenia Belarusis. Um, I don't discuss these two individuals. The series is not produced by Feminist Offensiva, but the group was very active around the same time as the photographer was doing this series and the photographer has collaborated with that group extensively. And in one project I talk about in the chapter. Um, this particular series here is called 32 Gogol Street. It was created um, over several years as the photographer got to know the inhabitants of this particular house in Kiev, which had been a communal dwelling um, prior to the end of the Soviet Union and then was converted into tenement homes. But what's, what's interesting about this series is it really is an ethnography of women's experiences um, during and after the end of the Soviet Union and it's multi-generational. So the photographer kept a blog while she was, while she was creating the, the images and there are many interviews in the blog. Um, I don't know if she has plans to publish it, but I quote from, from her writings in this particular chapter. And I also quote a, a lot from the scholar Svetlana Boyim, who has written a, a wonderful book called Common Places about the spatial, cultural spatial geography of um, communal dwellings after and towards the end towards the end of Glasnost, but then after the fall of the, the wall and the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, and she has developed out of that a political theory of um, she calls it another freedom. That's her other book that is sort of complicating the ideas that we bring as Westerners or as researchers from the US coming to see what emancipation for women might be like or what um, the possibilities for language for self emancipation could look like from different areas of society. So in this particular series, I, I am very interested in the background in the building itself as a character, because the you know, Shafa here, for example, um, Shafa being a word in Ukrainian that doesn't quite translate in the same way into English as curio cabinet. Um, it, they, these are almost mini museums and the meanings that are given to the material world uh, become um, imbued with layers of significance that look different to different generations as they encounter each other not only in, in words, but also in the visual forms that are at play throughout my book in the works that I look at. And here's a good example, side-by-side -side image of the photograph of the exterior of the building by Yevgenia Belarusis and Alexander Rodchenko's iconic image, Fire Escape from 1925. So in, in this particular way of, looking at the images side by side, we begin to see how time is um, a device that, that is you know, interesting to see where the projected future in the early 20s and, and the you know, earlier avant-garde um, have been reworked in contemporary art to show the passage of time um, in, a, in a way that is interesting to think about in terms of what other scholars have already written about nostalgia, not only in Ukraine, but also in other parts of the former Soviet Union. Um, I'm thinking of Sergei Oshakin's work and um, Alexei Yurchak, everything was forever until it was no more. Um, but here we're once removed from those ideas of nostalgia that those scholars are writing about because here it's almost nostalgia for another's nostalgia. It's, it's a memory that 
Yevgenia yeah, Belarusets, for example, would not have because she didn't grow up under the Soviet Union, but she's encountering others' memories and building continuity from that and showing, um, you know, experiences that are contradictory or marginalized in the present. Here is another side-by-side -side image. Um, I want to move forward because we don't have much time and I want to hear from our discussants. Um, again, a beautiful image from this particular series. And <clears throat> this artist has since produced many more projects. <laughs> She's very prolific as are many of the artists in Ukraine. Um, writing this book, it was very challenging because things were shifting all the time. And um, I was about halfway through it when the Maidan revolution of dignity happened and I had to recalibrate a lot of things. Um, this was an exhibit in 2013 that I talk about in my fourth chapter, Disputed Territory, and it happened at the National Art Museum of Ukraine. I am showing this particular image from the post exhibition, um, sort of breakdown of the wall that was painted inside of the exhibit and then distributed to passers-by because the the project, the way it was organized, reminded me a lot of uh, State Written by Mark Wallinger, which took place in London 2007. So this, you can see here, these um, posters were, you know, a lot of them were um, anti-Iraq war posters. And I had encountered this particular protest when I visited London in 2003. It was outside on the street, not far from the museum for several years. And then um, the city created an ordinance where you could not protest within a certain very distinct jurisdiction around parliament. And the line for protest, actually, the, the line that demarcated where you could and could not protest ran directly through the center of the art museum. So as a, a performative gesture, the artist Mark Wallinger moved the protest from outside on the streets into the museum, straddling that particular demarcation line. So it was a double, you know, meaning of protest at that point, one that also was contesting the line of what one can and cannot do as a citizen in public to express their political views. And I think that in some in my book, I compare the disputed territory, even the name kind of gives us a sense of um, the symbolic meaning here within the context of the National Art Museum. And then a few months later, the revolution happening right along the street, running the length of this museum um, in which the barricade dividing the protesters from the police was you know, right there, the contact line and, and the worst clashes of the revolution happening right there. So. Um, the resonance, I think, between art and territory and belonging becomes so immediate in this context. And the fourth chapter of my book is entitled Bad Myth, Interrevolutionary Experiences of Revolution and War. I'm looking at how the myths of the 20th century not only um, inform, but also in in memories, in conversations, are flowing through and being contested by the current generation of artists I'm looking at in my book. I should say that I'm, this book is by no means an, a comprehensive overview of all contemporary art because I'm looking particularly at a generation that grew up between the Orange Revolution and the Maidan, Maidan Revolution of Dignity, largely in now in their 30s when I was doing this project in their 20s, because there was um, 
there were a few, there are a few things that bind that generation. And a few of them are that they tend to be very multilingual, have had experiences living and working abroad, which makes them very different from their parents. Um, they're working in collectives as curators, artists, critics, translators. And I talk about in my introduction about the collective itself as a political and cultural site in Ukraine with a history that is very much linked to the 20s. Um, and many in this generation are funded from NGOs, um, grassroots initiatives in the EU, sometimes the Ukrainian Ministry of Culture in more recent years. And what binds them all in their works that I've curated, that I've chose curated for my book, is the body and identity, gender, sexuality are contested in, in really central ways. And here you can see Vlado Ralko's image from the um, hundreds of graphics that she created as part of Kiev Diary looking back on 2014. She was creating them actually in medias res as she was on the Maidan. Um, and in, in this piece, I'm very interested because the figure of a grandmother fallen here um, with the um, Maidan clearly in the background um, is almost like a doubling of the Lenins that were falling at the same time around the country. And this is an image by Lesse Homenko, who I talk about in chapter four and the group Revolutionary Experimental Space that she was a co-founder of. But I really like this image because it has the blue sky and the wheat field, you know, clear, clear identification with the Ukraine, Ukrainian modern nation, um, but also kind of a pastoral image that evokes some 19th century ideas, but and also early 20th century, but very, you know, um, non age specific, you have sneakers here. And it's also not the sort of slim media focused uh, Consumer, consumerist idea of sexuality that we saw in the first image I showed today of the feminine activist um, juxtaposed against commercial advertising. The last image I will end on today is um, from Kiev Pride 2019. And I don't write extensively in my book about the history of Kiev Pride, but I cover more the history of the women's marches. And I, I included this in my conclusion of my book because I wanted to, again, open the door for future work for more research in, in this area. But I also included because I wanted to mention that throughout the book, I rely a lot on um, sociology as, as a way of reading culture. I think this was something um, at the time I was writing that the interdisciplinary institutes that I was working in were really excited about and encouraging and supportive. And I, th and I think that we need, um, you know, more and more interdisciplinary work in Ukrainian studies that can bring together science, uh, social sciences and culture in interesting ways. But maybe that's, that's just my um, two cents from the standpoint of academia. So I will end with that and then we can hopefully um, turn the floor over. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Jessica. And so now we will have a response from each of the discussants and um, shall we go then in alphabetical order um, for responses and um, perhaps um, Oksana Burhobetska could start. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, hello to the audience who listen to us. And uh, Jessica, thank you very much uh, for this uh, proposition to me to uh, read your um, new book and to uh, this possibility to uh, like reflect of, uh, on history, which is uh, quite very fresh for me. And 
this reading of your book, it was also um, as a journey of uh, through my own life. Uh, and sometimes I've read this book as uh, my own diary. <laughs> it was very interesting because you know that uh, all we know that um, the memory, um, our memory works in a way that we often forget many things. Sometimes we um, just uh, too many things happen in one time and we miss something or we can be overwhelmed or tired. And um, it's very, very interesting how uh, different uh, people fix the uh, events uh, that we live together in different points of views and how you, you, I can compare with my uh, own experience. Uh, for example, um, when you uh, write about this um, uh, feminist offensive march, uh, when crowd uh, came to Lesya Ukrainka's monument to tie um, to, to, to rally there and to tie the uh, purple handkerchief on Lesya's neck, and um, I was there in, in this moment. So it um, was exciting to, to understand that Jessica also maybe uh, was there, but we didn't know each other <laughs> at the time. And so what also impressed me a lot in Jessica's book is this. Um, is her references and uh, comparison and parallels with the um, so with Soviet avant-garde and with the uh, memory of Soviet times and how um, um, younger generation, uh, as uh, you describe in this Genia Belarus pro project and other, uh, how this uh, memory um, absorbed it and comprehended by younger generation. And I also uh, want to like to share with you one of my memories. Uh, because I mm, remember uh, from my early childhood the end of the Soviet period, and so this is in attempt to interpret maybe the title of your book also, uh, where the key word is women. <laughs> so, uh, if you can imagine me, the a little girl, um, and I, I entered the school um, at 1980, and I went to school every day through my Nezaleznosti, which was at the time uh, called the October Revolution Square. And uh, in every big holiday, during every big holidays, uh, they were on the building, on facades, on the buildings, uh, very big, huge portraits of uh, state leaders, of Politburo, of uh, Communist Party. And um, they were so huge that now we can only see uh, some commercial advertisement in Kiev in the buildings <laughs> in such sizes. So, and uh, going um, every day to school and looking on these big male uh, figures uh, which represent power and glory. I uh, like, um, sometimes I reflected uh, which will be my role as a, as a girl, as a woman in this, in this society. Um, and this is uh, like in a way these images, they shape of course my identity as well. And then uh, we had the revolution and we uh, had independence and uh, later again a revolution and again a revolution. <laughs> and um, what is a revolution? Yeah, so um, uh, also while reading your book, um, uh, that uh, what I like uh, that you read in your book that you, um, uh, you, you didn't like, glorify uh, revolution, but you try to collect to, to show this um, complexity, this uh, like um, jeterogeneous, yes, of these um, events. And uh, the revolution is when uh, people who feel marginalized or neglected or superfluous, they rise again to the authorities to be visible and heard. And so this female um, image of revolution, which is very visible in your book is, um, um, for example, as you mentioned, uh, this um, image of Mariano French Revolution, which was one day during last decade presented in France in um, image of Ukrainian activist from Femin Group. Uh, so, um, and I want to read short piece from uh, Jessica's book about um, this uh, subversive and controversial character of revolution. In sense then, there were many Maidans in the event over the winter of 2013-14. Uh, the different encampments, parties, social groups, observers and others on the physical space of the square plotted themselves in cartographies of politics teasered differently for each depending on their views. And later a moment arrived when many realized that the wide range of demands on the Maidan could never be met. And um, um, 
So, uh, uh, what is important also, uh, and I like one of the images um, in your book, the, uh, this uh, image of Jana Kadyrova's monument to the monument the, in the end of the book, is a statue that ar artist created <coughs> for small Ukrainian town Shargorod in 2009, uh, long before uh, Maidan revolution and before this Leninopad and the wider destruction of Soviet monuments. And the, uh, this statue uh, like present um, the monument before uh, opening. It, so it's uh, some figure covered with a cloth, but the cloth uh, here is the body of uh, the monument itself. So we will never know who is the hero. And it's um, in in interview with Janna, I I found uh, related to the the opening of this monument in Shargorod. She was asked by some local woman, because people asked her who is the hero to whom this monument, and one woman asked her, can it be my son? He died recently. And Jana answered, yes, of course. So for me, it's uh, much about the, the revolution, because in uh, during the revolution, everyone can be hero. So in the revolution, it's uh, your choice. You choose to go to the street to protest, and you care about revolution. But revolution doesn't care about you. So a revolution uh, doesn't fix any benefits, and we uh, must struggle for these benefits uh, again and again. And uh, as we one day we had independence, and we must like think what then. So it's not enough to like have these um, uh, wonderful things. And uh, for example, during this summer, being in the middle of uh, Black Lives Matter uh, protests revolutionary protests in US. I began to read some uh, black authors. And among them, I read Laurent Hansberry, The Raisin in the Sun. It's a um, like significant piece of uh, literature of black liberation. And uh, it was in this text, uh, in this play, <clears throat> some words of young heroine Benita, who often uh, like um, performed with some feminist statements in this text. And she said one phrase, and. Uh, which I felt very related to Ukraine, to situation in Ukraine. And I want like to read this short piece, but I will um, replace the word black with word Ukrainian. So <laughs> um, if you let me do this. So after a series of dramatic events, Benita said, independence and then what? <clears throat> what about all the crooks and thieves? and just plain idiots who will come into power and steal and plunder the same as before. Not, not only now they will be Ukrainians and do it in the name of a new independence. What about them? So, and Ukraine experienced a lot of such things. And uh, you know, we can read also this in the Jessica's books. It's a robbery of the country by oligarchs, class formed largely uh, from Soviet elite. It's a growth of right-wing politics uh, with the censorship, uh, which uh, and Jessica like, described a few cases of censor censorship in Ukrainian art during last decades. Uh, and this very resemble uh, sometimes to Soviet-style censorship. And also, along with the external, external aggression of Russia, we uh, that led to war. We have violence of far-right groups that, again against fellow citizens. So uh, and this why <clears throat> this because the uh, critical power of feminism is very important and very needed, even if authorities or if contra-revolution forces decided it's not needed, it's superfluous or it's uh, um, like try to to fight against this. And uh, if uh, I found that Jessica's books much more about revolutionary art, um, which is in opposition, which is not official art. Yes, it's. Um, in opposition, but from which position this revolutionary art speaks? And here I, I want to compare uh, the, uh, with the idea of uh, French researcher Isabelle Alphonse. I presented her book last year in Kyiv, and the book uh, called uh, To the Aesthetics of Emancipation, and uh, is about the decent tradition of queer art. And so Isabelle affirmed that it's not possible to settle down in queer identity or institutionalize it because this is a marginal position to analyze and criticize. 
And because of this, the queer, the queer position is very creative and potentially revolutionary. So, and I think um, this um, Ukrainian art, which you analyze in your book, um, also uh, can be like described as, as this. And uh, artists can speak not only from their own marginalized positions or experience, but also can be a voices for marginalized communities and as in Zhenya Belarus's project from this uh, about life of these people in dilapidated house in the center of Kiev. And um, also what we discussed with Isabel, it was about art history because of course your book, um, uh, not only about art, but of course uh, you explain this history, this events through art. And um, that we know the art history as we know it in its classical uh, like style is uh, uh, mostly male history, which was wrote by white men. And um, the, um, the, the feature of this history is uh, to present us the line of names of genius. And sometimes it uh, seems that these genius, they appeared from nowhere, so from their own nature. And what is important in, in feminist approach, which Isabel uh, used, and I see this also in your book, that very important like to research the context when, where, in which art appear, uh, because uh, artists never work with, along with his or her own genius. There's all, 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 always uh, some influences, some collaborations, some political and social events which influence this, this affect some art. And to research all this, all this um, complexity is what uh, can bring us um, more understanding of art and of history through art. And uh, and from this uh, position, I found you, I found your book like very feminist in uh, your approach to researching the art and the, this all things. And um, uh, but. Uh, as I said, this this history is very fresh, and you also mentioned that it was not like um, there are no archive. Yes, so, <laughs> that you can research based on the previous researches. So it's very, very fresh history, and I also was uh, uh, excited how you find uh, the way to show all these events of the present, of past, and um, I found it for me it was kind of patchwork, you know this uh, um, bringing together small pieces and then all, all like um, very dynamic montage of um, documentary movie. And so this, this will be my question that I want to ask you, how you uh, combine all this? Because so many things and uh, you managed to do this very dynamic. So it's very interesting to read. You appear in one moment, then you are in the beginning of 20th century, then you are somewhere in the West. So how you did this and um, and maybe you can share how was the process of writing? Is it was the some um, long period, or you just uh, collect uh, your sketches and then accomplish the whole book? And thank you. Very thank much. you, thank you, Oksana. And so, Jessica, would you like to answer that question now before we move on to the other discussants? Sure. Um, so. The writing process for me was also very collaborative with other mentors of mine um, who are historians. And I studied historiography with Brian Porter at University of Michigan and also was working a lot with Geneviève Zibzitsky and researching her book, her next book. Um, and they, I, I was observing how they were working with time because <clears throat> to write a book, you have to come up with your own scale and and the time your time period you're working with. And Franco Moretti's book, Epic Time, I think is one of the best um, books written on how to write time. And uh, for me, I was I was always moving things around as everything kept changing. I didn't know what the end point of this project was until 2014. Then I could really see it. And I cut a lot of material out of this project and I have lots of files of things that, that I would like to publish sometime. Um, I think also the vignettes like going between present tense and past tense for me was a mark of my training as a literary scholar.
scholar and and how writing about literature is really different than writing about actual events and when the final edits for this book were taking place I had actually like to defend my position against the copy editor and saying no we can't switch this to past tense this stays in present tense because there are places that I I want people to kind, kind of pause on and see time as in in a little bit of an anarchic way actually I haven't talked about anarchy or anarchism but that's also part of this title superfluous women borrowing it from Ivan Turgenev and from fathers and sons so I'll talk about that later because I want to I want to hear from the other discussants but okay, yeah. thank you. sure okay thank you Jessica so we're moving on so um Mayhill. Yes, great. Um, so thank you so much for this opportunity to engage with this very um, rich and dense and exciting text that I'm coming to as a historian. Um, shout out to University of Toronto Press, um, which also published my book on the 20s and 30s, so that early avant-garde. So I'm coming very much to this exploration of 21st century art sort of steeped in, in the early 20th century. So. I wanna make um, sort of three comments about um, some things I think are really important about this text. And then I wanna make three um, comment style questions to Jessica that she can comment on and respond to as she wishes. Um, so first of all, I think this book is really important in that it uses the inter-revolutionary generation as an analytic category. Um, and I think thinking of this um, body of work and networks of people, not as networks, um, not as just post-Soviet, not as Ukrainian, but actually as an inter-revolutionary milieu. And that even if they might not put themselves in the same category, um, thinking of the ways that growing up in late communism being shaped by 2004, moving through to 2013, 2014, really does offer the contours of a generation, I think is a very productive analytic category. And I think 20 years from now, we can look back on this text as very much kind of laying the foundation for this category of an inter-revolutionary generation as we trace what happens to these people and these artists. Um, so I think that's really um, interesting. Um, my second point is that um, this is the most interesting work I've read on Femin. Um, and I will just say that I had the book out on my kitchen table. I had a friend over for a distanced, you know, social engagement, um, who's a very Slavic studies um, scholar. She was, you know, paging through the book and she said, oh, I didn't know Femin was Ukraine. And it really spoke to this argument that Jessica makes about Femin kind of leaving Ukraine, going global, going into these global conversations, and in a way making themselves less significant in the Ukrainian context. Um, and I think that even though you're able to pull out some criticism of Femen, um, still you say, but, we, but they made us look. Like, they made us look. And I think that that very smartly brings Femen into the story. It's a great way to start the story um, of activism and art. Um, and uh, I thought that was really smart. And the third comment I'd like to make is a really interesting absence, which is there's no discussion of what might make this art Ukrainian. And I loved that. And I thought that um, the nation can so often be a constricting category and that by just discussing this art and these artists in terms of the structures and the influences and their world, without trying to make that sort of a teleological category of some kind of specifically Ukrainian art um, was really liberating. And I think um, it was a tribute to your, um, your work as an interdisciplinary scholar, but also it kind of, I think, opens up a field of, of you know, writing about um, art that happens in Ukraine beyond that sort of descriptor of Ukrainian. Um, I thought that was really um, important. So sort of three comment questions. So the first is um, your intellectual geography is really fascinating. 
And I was so struck with, in your chapter on museums, you talk about Marina Tsvetaeva at Tietsiyevo Musee, which I love, a text I love. But at, like as a historian, I would never use a pre-revolutionary Russian text by Tsvetaeva to talk about post-Soviet museums. Um, but it was cool. Um, and on one page you have like Khvilevi, Kuchma and Alphonse Mucha, like all together on one page. And it's like Rancière here, Szymborska here, Offensiva in Polish transliteration here, um, Turgenev, Fathersons and Raznachinsi, you know? And, um, and so I wondered if how conscious you were of that um, of to what degree that is sort of your intellectual landscape, right? You're reading this in terms of Satayeva, so you put it in your book. To what degree that's conscious um, and, and what kind of, what the result of that is. And for me, the result was interestingly, um, you know, by, by using that intellectual landscape in a way you do, you do take this, it's an argument in and of itself. And you do take this art to sort of a larger context, right? Um, you're mentioning these big theorists. So yes, you could assign a chapter in a graduate seminar on, you know, I don't know, contemporary art, right? Um, so uh, your intellectual landscape. Um, the second sort of question is a, a theme running through your book is the issues of public and private and public space and artists claiming public space. Um, claiming space that was state space and making it public space. Um, and I think that's one of the most challenging um, concepts for, for the post-Soviet cultural landscape is what is public and what is private and what is state space, right? What is a state museum? How can a state museum be open to a larger, um, a larger public? Who is the public? Um, and you have this one phrase um, that you talk about um, in the future, there should be public access to interpretive practices. Um, and I love that phrase, but I want you to unpack it. Like what, what, who is the public that needs access? Um, who needs these interpretive practices? Who gets to define what the public is? Um, does the state have a role in the public? Can state people be public people? Um, what is the role today of new state institutions, right? Like Ukrainsky Institute or UKF, who are new stakeholders and new players, right? Are they state, are they public? Where are they? Um, and third, that leads me to this question that is um, nitty gritty for historians of the arts um, and for the post-Soviet as well, which is audiences and funding, right? These fundamental vectors of infrastructure. And so, um, uh, I wanted to know more about how these artists get funding. I mean, who funds Yevgenia Belarusets? Who funded 32 Gogol Street? Like, how do they get money? How do they pay rent, right? Um, and who is the audience? And particularly, I was so struck with 32 Gogol Street. I loved your analysis of that project. Um, who is the audience for that? Is it, is it sort of general art people is it Ukrainian? Um, is it Kiev? Um, is it the inhabitants of 32 Gogol Street? I mean, are they part of the audience for that art? Are they part of that art's public? What art do they like? What art do they consume? Um, do you have to know Rodchenko to understand those photographs, right? So this sort of this question of audience. Um, and finally, on the topic of the Soviet past, um, you make a comment at the end of your book that art still has urgency in Ukraine. Um, and I would 100% agree with you. And I wonder that, I wonder how that too is a legacy of the Soviet period actually, right? That, that um, yes, you have state controlled art institutions, but you have arts institutions, you have museums, you have theaters, you have people who are sort of used to going to a museum or the theater or hear a concert, that, that there is art can be a field for negotiating um, political futures, a field for negotiating identity and belonging in a way that maybe it can't like in the United States, right? And so the ways that 
um, even though this is a book about this inter-revolutionary generation, 2004, 21st century, it is still so much a legacy of the Soviet past, right? And the ways that this Soviet past, I think it can be um, overwhelming how it continues to play a role, right? And, and we're sort of continuing to interpret how it is still there, how it's transforming, how it shapes people, even people born after its collapse, right? Um, so those are my um, comments, so they're not questions necessarily, but just things that I was thinking of as I read your very rich um, uh, and engaging text. And so I would love to hear your thoughts. Thank you, Mayhill. So Jessica, would you like to respond now to? Sure, respond? thank thank you. I'm gonna rewatch this recording a few times and really soak that in and then I'll think back to how I should have responded, but I will do my very, very best. Um, in terms of intellectual geography, um, yeah, it's really the, the subterranean networks in, within this text, the links are really getting at sort of deep rivers of the construction of a Slavic femininity across the European continent, which go back to Voltaire's forays eastward um, and, you know, Catherine the Great's travels westward. Um, it goes back to the figure of uh, a Salome, sort of Eastern harem that has quite honestly racist undertones. Um, and there's also, you know, Franz Mucha and the flower crown, which appears over and over in, in Femin's iconography of their group. And with Svetayeva, that particular inclusion in the museums was, I guess, more connected also to her father being a major figure in setting up some of the first museums. But I, I wanted to introduce, I wanted to create a text that students could use that could be assigned in courses that would give a snapshot that was not, um, you know, confining an idea of gender and sexuality to, well, this is us in the West, and that's them over there, that we are actually co-creations of each other and that, that the divisions are oftentimes assigned in courses that would give... Oh, okay, now I'm unmuted. Um, but the second, the second thing I wanted to mention in the title um, the idea of superfluous women is an allusion to the superfluous man, which was a term popularized by Ivan Turgenev that applied to a character type originating in Pushkin's Yevgeny Onegin. This description first described men of status and wealth of the 1830s, men whose privilege largely prevented them from contributing to society and were too young to participate in actual revolution. The notion later gained widespread currency in Russian literature to convey the idea of a lost generation and was then also picked up by African-American authors like Ralph Ellison reading Dostoevsky's crit criticisms of the superfluous man in his idea of an invisible man or an un and then an underground man. Um, Dostoevsky's notes from the underground and also notes from the House of the Dead were working with this idea of an underground man who has a split consciousness and that is Ralph Ellison's Invis Invisible Man, my favorite American novel. I think women oftentimes have to inhabit a split consciousness and we inhabit multi multiple roles often co in contradiction with one another. And in the turn of a generation, what once was superfluous suddenly becomes central again. So that is where the, the title is coming from public space, private and state um, space, who is working with these concepts. These are revolutionary concepts. Now we're in a pandemic and everything is changing again. What's public, what's private? Um, I think these are excellent questions that I'm gonna mull over more as to you know who needs access to different um, constructions of space, who needs interpretive practices of these art, um, works and can state be public and private. But I think this, my response here also connects to some of what Oksana was saying because 
Um, again, this idea of anarchism for me is really important here that, that I think all knowledge production should be um, anarchic production. I think we should be free of, of <laughs> state and institutional predefined responses. I don't mean that anarchy in the sense of throwing um, bombs or being violent in the streets. I mean that, you know, in writing this project, I was at University of Michigan um, near the Labadee archive, which takes the history of anarchism seriously in showing a kind of troubling of um, inherited ideas that, that we should all be questioning our roles within the institutions we belong to that makes them stronger and it makes our society stronger because we can start to see who's left behind or who's left out and then include them in um, and this idea of a dissident and an art activist has become very um, discussed widely in the last 10 years and it's central to my text, but it's also central, I think, to a lot of people working on culture across the world in, in different places on the globe. I know Oksana has um, interviewed a lot of artists who are also activists in her book, Right to Truth. And <clears throat> um, I hope that, as you mentioned, you know, where the nation sometimes in writing a, a piece of scholarly work can, can feel constricting in, in how you're writing about history. I think placing someone on a spectrum of artists or activists can also be constricting because I know in Mayhill in your work, writing about socially engaged artists or you know, the, what happened in, at the end of the 20s uh, being a tragedy that I think can, is with us in some parts of the world um, is something that makes art more than art, but less than art. <laughs> if that, that can, it's hard to measure the immediacy against the West because I think that we also, you know, we have our, a lot of, um, the same kinds of questions that artists are asking in Ukraine, which is why I think this book will resonate with students, especially students who are just struggling to find a place in a world right now that is completely turned upside down, public versus private space. Um, you know, all of the, these questions, experience can, I think, be very helpful for them to see experience that is not so much in their own context, but. Anyway, I really want to hear from Tamara as well, so. Thank you, Jessica. I was just about to say we should move on and we can return to some of these points at the very end. Um, but uh, Tamara, it's your turn. <laughs> yes, hello. Thanks a lot for organizing this event and I'll uh, try to be rather brief in order we have more time for discussion. And uh, I'm so happy that uh, Jessica was uh, at Kyiv Mohilek Academy Department of Sociology. I was uh, in the US during that time. And it's uh, now very exciting to, to see the result of your a lot of uh, number of years of work. And I am not an artist uh, and uh, not very uh, deep in Soviet uh, history and poetry, but I would like to say that actually your book is very interesting also um, to read through more sociological uh, perspective. Uh, I think the, uh, the, what is interesting about this book uh, that you uh, use case studies as a method and you really very deeply analyze uh, uh, NGO groups or NGOs or people whom you really like and uh, it's very uh, it's very interesting to see as you said this western gaze on famine and famine is really really was very very popular uh, organizations to study a lot of international scholars as they came to Ukraine to, to do this research but still even fr from your book uh, we may learn um, 
more and more about famine. It's a very dynamic group. And as we have discussed already today, now it's almost uh, lost its uh, popularity and interest in Ukraine, even despite the fact that during our past uh, local election, famine, uh, they were protesting. So it was solo protest, but still I think it was not uh, so uh, actively uh, shown uh, and discussed in media. Also, another group that you really like, and it's clear, is Feminist Offensiva. And you even mentioned, I think you mentioned Anakwa twice during your text, that it's the largest uh, feminist or women's rights group in Ukraine. And uh, but uh, I think it's not enough uh, figures or information to prove this because in Ukraine uh, our I would say geography of uh, uh, organizations and activism is really wide. And when we take it's interesting actually to see through uh, our independence how in 90s a lot of women's NGOs appeared. Uh, but still they were afraid of this word feminism. And I think what is very uh, brave about your book is that you, you're not afraid of feminism and you very clearly mark a lot of uh, uh, initiatives as feminist. But even in 90s in Ukraine, we've already got some organizations, for example, in, in Vinnytsia, who that used feminist in their title. But of course, they are like uh, very local and not so popular. Uh, as for revolutions, as the two mark points, uh, Orange Revolution and Yevromaidan, I think you, it's uh, uh, also very positive about your book that you showed that it was so-called windows of opportunities for women and for um, for women's visibility and importance of gender equality topic, you don't use particularly this uh, uh, this terminology like gender equality, but still, uh, after Orange Revolution in Ukraine, a lot of reforms happened, uh, legislation, uh, uh, we've got legislation on equal rights and opportunities of uh, women and men, and actually, quite a lot was done to, to pay attention to this uh, problem. And, uh, but after, during Euromaidan, and you also, you show this uh, actually in your book with different cases, uh, women became very, as a group, uh, very, uh, very visible. And uh, actually the role of feminist offensive, and you also show that it's visibility of women in read activism. And uh, also what is important through social problems perspective of this book that you, you show this problem of economic inequality, uh, also problem of uh, uh, sexism, sex uh, tourism, sex extremism. Of course, you, sh you show this through, mainly through your, for example, case study of famine. And uh, you also, uh, uh, you mentioned Yulia Tomoshenko, it's actually a very famous uh, female politician also abroad and through uh, uh, actually this Western gaze, uh, Yulia Tomoshenko as famine case uh, abroad, they position themselves as feminist, but inside Ukraine, they uh, actually avoided this mark uh, or label of uh, that was quite negative. But I I think you also, it's very nice that you use this idea of uh, strategic essentialism. You may not call it in a, this way, but it's actually to, uh, it's about so-called Slavic femininity and how women strategically, like Yulia Tomoshenko, like famine, they use their femininity to, 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 to gain their goals. Uh, also, I think uh, uh, what uh, I, I agree with Michael, it's very good that in your book you don't uh, uh, you, you don't take nationalism and uh, you don't uh, uh, 
show all these discussions around nationalism it's quite hot topic but still i think it's uh, uh, of course it's very difficult to put everything in one uh, uh, in one um, in one book and questions that i would like to ask uh, actually uh, it's uh, so, uh, it's uh, words that you cite from interview with feminine uh, activist anna hutzel uh, who said that uh, uh, that uh, it was gap or cleavage between academic and grassroots feminism, and your background is uh, first of all academic, and of course you your experience was a lot connected with grassroots feminism. So what do you think about this? If there is this gap or not, or how it changed recently? Uh, thank, thank you. Um, I just have a there, thank you to all to all of you for a very uh, subtle and complex discussion. There are a lot of points to cover here. I just want to throw in one more point into the mix. I don't know if Jessica will have time to to answer this as well because there are a lot of unanswered questions. But I just wanted to bring up one point, uh, not quite a question, but just your reflections on power, class, gender, and art. Um, the Polish writer Agatha Pizik writes about this, you know, in Poor But Sexy and also about going forward, you know, in, in post-communist societies, uh, you know, who, who has the power, who has the funding to make the art, what societal structures can do that. Um, there are certain uh, perhaps feminist ideals that are disputed in, you know, in post-communist um, Eastern Europe, perhaps the neoliberal ideal of the entrepreneurial woman versus um, women who are, are more drawn to collective action. So I mean, this is not really quite a question, but just maybe opening a door for reflection on this. Jessica, there's a lot to discuss. We don't have much time left, but over to you and let's go forward. <laughs> sure. Um, funding and law are infrastructures. Mayhill used this word in one of her comments she had emailed to me, infrastructures um, within cultural production and also activism being grassroots activism or um, the activist scholar as it emerges in our writings. Um, I don't think there is a difference between, you know, academic feminism and grassroots or, you know, activist feminism. I, I think that scholars are very much um, taking chances in writing about feminism and claiming the work because so often, um, when regimes change, people trade the word feminism for a general term of human rights. But I think it's important to contest the word because um, it's an ongoing heuristic. It's not a label, it's, it's a live debate. And I think academics belong in the debate. I think activists outside of the academy very much belong at the table too. Um, for this question of funding, um, I think a new book should be written about art markets in Ukraine today. There's a lot hidden from us by oligarchs. Oksana had mentioned also, you know, the struggles of, of um, the political scene in Ukraine being, you know, corruption being a major, major issue. And this impacts artists' access to markets and the, the potential for artist run spaces is something that comes up again and again in interviews that I have with people. They, they want to own the means of their production is what I'm hearing. Um, law, I can say, I can give two references here for the sake of time for interested listeners. I was part of a talk a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago, maybe longer, sense of time is fading with the pandemic, um, about cultural diplomacy with uh, representatives from Ukrainian Institute, which is the new culture institute operated by Ministry of Culture of Ukraine. And that conversation also involved scholars from uh, Harvard Ukraine Research Institute and was organized by several institutions, Ukrainian, uh, diaspora institutions, but also academic institutions. That's posted on YouTube. It's called, Is There Room for Culture? And I also have a link on my website. And in that conversation, 
um, Ukrainian Institute presents ideas for cultural diplomacy, for Ukraine developing its own cultural diplomacy and invites Westerners, I hate that category, but um, let's just say invites interlocutors from other nations to participate in that. Um, Yezhi Onu wrote a follow-up piece, which is also very interesting. Um, at, he, he was the cultural attache uh, from Canada to Ukraine for several years. Um, infrastructures law, also the legislation of culture, what is considered censor censorship and what is not is being contested in Ukraine. I talk about a couple of cases in my book, but there are more. Um, I also recently wrote a piece with Natalia Chermalech, who is an anthropologist originally from Kiev and was very active in the art scene in the 2000s as a curator. She's now graduated from Institute, Graduate Institute Geneva and wrote her dissertation about the lawyers around Pussy Riot in their public trial and how public law or the idea of it around art and performance in Russia has changed. And I think similar studies could, could and should happen in Ukraine to look at the, the legislation of, of art. And this, um, if you look at the history of censorship debates in the United States around pornography in the 70s, there were a lot of feminists involved in those discussions and the, they fall on both sides. I mean, the idea that feminists are somehow on one side of the political spectrum is not, um, is not accurate. So I'm thinking of Catherine McKinnon in in the question of censorship, of um, you know, restricting what can be represented, actually had a negative impact, according to liberal, progressive, sex-positive feminists, that argued the I, the definition of propaganda should be expanded. So I think that future debates in Ukraine will largely be tied to. Um, intellectual property to the definition of censorship, definition of propaganda, and this all impacts feminists as well. It, it's only going to move more and more in that direction because we are in the information economy and um, we haven't talked much about different forms of cultural capital and navigating that, but that's an area also that could be explored more. Um, yeah, so I will turn the um, we have a question from the audience, maybe for everyone. I mean, we, we need to wrap up uh, soon. And this is a general question, a very open-ended. What is the, uh, what did they come in from the public? What is the future of feminism in Ukraine <laughs> going forward? Um, well, let's also look to Ukraine's neighbors for a minute. What's happening in Poland? What's happening in Belarus? I don't know, maybe, maybe, Oksana or Tamara being located in Ukraine right now can can also enlighten us to that. Mm, I, can I speak? Yeah? Uh, I can say that just in a few words that uh, we have to struggle a lot <laughs> because as we see, even looking the West situation when where the feminism uh, in 70s, like uh, there were a lot of conquests of feminism, but uh, what we then uh, saw during Trump's era and uh, is still in Poland, this uh, again and again situation with this ban of abortion repeat again and again, and the woman again and again uh, must go to the streets to protest. And we have a lot of issues also in Ukraine to struggle. So the future of Ukrainian feminism is the struggle, I think. <laughs> I agree. At the same time, I think feminism is becoming more and more popular, especially among younger generations. Uh, different uh, groups, uh, new groups appear. 
like in universities, uh, among teenagers, man feminists uh, becoming more public. And we still have performative activism very popular. For example, a couple of weeks ago near Polish embassy, it was very, I would say, impressive and re quite radical, critical feminist uh, performative uh, activism on the support of Polish women. At the same time, because now feminism is more and more visible, we have more anti-feminist initiatives. And even you can't believe, but even <laughs> in this month, uh, uh, one uh, professor defended doctor uh, doctorate dissertation, so doctor of science and sociology, on really anti-gender, anti-feminist uh, agenda with some uh, a very, uh, but I would say very, uh, 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 was very <laughs> creative <laughs> terminology, like for example, matriarchal racism. And now in Facebook and inside our sociological community, we discuss what to do with this uh, text. Uh, should we write some response? Should we write the Ministry of Education? It was done in Zaporizhia, in the, so not in Kiev, and actually somehow it's uh, we only saw the results of this. So in academia, you see. Uh, it's quite possible to defend uh, uh, to defend dissertation even with quite uh, non-scientific anti-gender agenda. So it will be very uh, a lot of fun <laughs> and uh, interest more interesting cases to study and to write uh, more new books on this topic. Um, I just want to give Mehil a last opportunity if she want to add any comments, and then Jessica, uh, we can wrap up. Um, I, I can't speak to the future of feminism in Ukraine, but I think as uh, an American, I can say the future of feminism in the United States is also something that we could discuss, right? It's not, it's not exclusive. The questioned future of feminism and, and potential hurdles and um, uh, negative uh, voices is something that I think we have to be vigilant about um, everywhere. Um, and um, yeah, uh, that's I will I will leave it at that to give Jessica the last word. Oh, J Jessica, before your last word, we have a very interesting question from the public here um, that says that we know about you know uh, feminism in in books and in film. Um, however, could you perhaps talk a little bit more about the presence of feminism in painting, and and what what did you encounter in your research and uh, with that specific uh, field? Um, I talk a little bit more in my book about, about the forms of painting forms and the histories, but if anyone is interested in more recent reference, there was an exhibit um, in fall of 2018. It took place at Pinchuk Art Center, but it was curated um, by feminists in Kiev. Um, it was called A Space of One's Own, and it was a retrospective of visual largely paintings from both the socialist realist period and also before in the, the early avant-garde um, juxtaposed with contemporary artists um, who were working in different media but the the majority of the installations in that exhibit were paintings so that's a great place to look for further information um, before moving on i wanted to uh, respond to what everyone was saying about the future of feminism in Ukraine. Um, I think something I have experienced, I should also mention my own position. I'm ethnically by heritage Polish, um, but I learned to speak Ukrainian before I learned to speak Polish. And I've spent 20 years traveling and working um, between Ukraine and the US. Um, in areas of Ukraine that were once Polish, once German, once Russian. So there have been times when um, my own positionality has helped me in my research being of Polish origin, but it's also worked against me. And some of those um, dismissals 
were illustrative to me in my research in, in, in showing me different borders um, in what people consider definitive for, for identities and our communication across identities. I would say a similar thing happens not only with you know, ethnicity, but class, race, and also the word feminism. It becomes a litmus in conversation. And for the future of feminism, I think what all of us can do, which will be really informative for us, is to pay attention to the form of the dismissal, because sometimes it's very subtle. You cannot always readily tell when someone is dismissing you because of your gender or because you said the, the bad word, feminism. Um, if we need reminders of creative, the creativity of accusation in how power hides itself, we can look back at many, many texts by women who were writing about being and feeling abject like Yulia Kristeva, who being a linguist, has an incredible insight into the power of language to dismiss and disrupt our own sense of confidence of self. And moving forward, each of us has a story to tell and we each need to defend it. So that's my idea for the future. <laughs> So um, we have basically one minute left, Jessica. If you have any uh, closing remarks that you would just like to um, okay, share with us. One, one. Oksana. Oh. I'm very briefly uh, what to, want to add uh, the, to the answer on the question of painting with a, a story that um, I've organized um, three feminist exhibitions in uh, Visual Culture Resource Center during 2015 and 17. And in, to one of these uh, exhibitions, I want very much to uh, bring um, paintings of Polish uh, artist Eva Yushkevich. So you can Google this name. But because the painting uh, as a medium is quite expensive to transport because it's me to, to um, cover with insurance and we didn't have money because all these exhibitions is uh, like always do, we do it on a very small budget. So finally we uh, showed these paintings in a screens in digital version, but uh, this is like the example of really painting, which uh, also feminist painting, which also call to the old history of paintings. So this artist, she presents women portraits and question the, uh, like this idea of muse and the, of the no name women. So this maybe who is interested can Google this name, Eva Yushkevich and look to these paintings, not to this spoil. Yeah. So, so Jessica, last words. Uh, thank you all for attending. And I hope that you will read this book, please consider reviewing it or passing it along to someone who might be interested in reviewing it. And I welcome all comments, feedback, engagements. Um, please feel free to contact me anytime. And thank you to my discussants today. This, this is um, really, really incredible. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And um, thank you all to all uh, to the participants of the panel. And we didn't get to a couple of the questions, but we will pass them along to the author. And you should be expecting a response, you know, at some point. Thank you again for a very wonderful, subtle, and complex um, discussion of the book. And um, thank you again. Thank you. Well, and I just want to make a, clo a few closing remarks. First of all, I want to give my huge thanks to Jessica and our panelists, May, Hill, Oksana, and Tamara. Thank you for bringing your expertise and experience around the table and engaging in such a fruitful, constructive and, um, and ex uh, exchanges throughout the discussion. I hope that our audience enjoyed you as much as I did. And my particular thank you uh, go to, uh, to our moderator, Peter. <clears throat> thank you for your excellent job chairing your, our panel discussion. And um, finally, my special thanks go to Srihi Skiba for technical support of this event. And thank you to everyone who has been with us and has been watching. Thank you very much. <laughs>